2024. Uh, this series, as uh, some of you know, began uh, Sunset Canyon Recreation Center uh, decades uh, ago, long before the hammer existed, um, under the aegis of Doris Curran, uh, whom a couple of you might even uh, remember, uh, as I do fondly, and she's still the kind of guiding spirit uh, of, the, of the readings. Um, if you are not already on a mailing list, there will be one, I think, circulated. You can put your names on it, or you can sign up, I think, near the, near the door so that you won't miss uh, any, any future readings that you want to come to. Um, <clears throat> I'm Stephen Yenser from the uh, English department at UCLA, which is one of the sponsors of the series. Um, the other chief sponsors are UCLA's Office of Recreation um, and, of course, the, the Hammer uh, Public Programs, which has a terrific, small, but absolutely uh, terrifically talented uh, staff. Uh, and it's, it's all headed by Claudia Bester, um, w without whom nothing. And I'm, I'm here this evening to uh, introduce Monica Yoon, who has recently published her fourth volume of poems, which was, I, I think, a finalist for the National Book Award. Uh, and actually, I think it might have, this is maybe her second uh, time that she's been a finalist for the National Book Award. Uh, it, it has a curious title, uh, From From, um, which is, uh, which tells us right away that she's willing to take a risk. I mean, it's, it's not a title that makes you jump up and say, oh yes, I've always wanted to read that book. <laughs> but uh, by the time you finish the book, you understand uh, what's going on with, with From. Um, it's, a, it's a volume that is uh, about, to pick another, uh, not necessarily interesting word right off, about race and, and identity, uh, ethnic identity. Um, and you find out in the course of reading it that this is indeed a, poem, a poet who, who takes a risk uh, and who is sure of what she wants to say and goes ahead and finds new ways to, to say it. And I'm going to touch uh, on just three aspects of, of her work as, as I understand them. Um, for, uh, for one of these uh, aspects or elements, and it's just maybe not the most interesting for some of you, there's the line, uh, the poetic line, to, to come to my point too abruptly, it's not clear always what genre uh, the work here is in. Um, instead of the conventional prosodic line, uh, the, the union of, unit of composition uh, often seems to be the sentence, uh, a grammatical unit uh, ending in a full stop, often without uh, clauses, many clauses uh, involved, um, somewhat as, as in Whitman, though, though quite different. Or sometimes the unit of composition is a clutch of, of sentences, uh, a prose passage, you might think. So while you can find from from in the poetry section of the, of the bookstores, uh, it's not certain that the contents of the book are, are poems as they have always been understood. Uh, prose poems then? Uh, I don't know. Do, do prose poems exist? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's not clear to me that they, that they do. Um, but in any case, uh, things get complicated along those lines, um, which takes us to the second aspect of Monica's work, uh, the, the sequence of the lines or passages, which frequently don't follow logically, though in the words, though the words of them uh, get, get repeated uh, in various ways. But looking down a page, one might think that uh, rather than forming a, uh, a linear sequence, you know, A, B, C, D, as you would in an essay or, or in a uh, book of discursive prose, uh, the lines uh, almost seem to lie athwart one another. Um, they echo each other in unusual ways uh, and make a sort of disorderly but very engaging weave. 
again, things are, are complicated. Then there are the notes to the poems at the end of the book. These notes are really interesting and edifying, uh, but they frequently shoot off in new directions, uh, making their own kind of distantly related points, or at least they seem distant related at first. So there's a series of poems in From From about the bird known as the magpie here, uh, which is a common symbol um, for Korea, common symbol of Korea. One note tells us that in some cultures, the magpie is associated with good luck, uh, and in others, it is associated with misfortune. Uh, in another note, we learn that the magpie is one of the very few animals, uh, including, I think, bottlenose dolphins, uh, and uh, Monica knows all about bottlenose dolphins too, and, uh, and great apes um, that pass the mirror test, which I'll not go into. I could, could tell you, but I'm not going to. I learned it from the, from the notes. It's an important behavioral test for uh, self-awareness. Now, these notes are not obviously related always to the poems they hang out with. Uh, but things are more complicated as it keeps happening uh, with this book than they, than they seem. Um, I'll add a little coda uh, to this disquisition that I'm giving you. So that We also learn the scientific name for the magpie, uh, which some of you probably know, is, is it's what's known as a tautonym. You know, no tautonyms? Tautonyms are, are, are words, scientific terms, in which the genus uh, and the species uh, are the same. Um, so that uh, the name for the magpie in, in Latin is pica pica, or pica pica, I suppose, if you're, if you're of that persuasion. Uh, it iterates specifically, it, it occurs to me, uh, from from. Uh, the, the title of the book, one sense of which, uh, from, from, is that the volume itself is about the eminently complicated answer to the apparently mundane question that we ask uh, about others' identities. Where are you from? Where are you from? What does it mean to be from somewhere? Well, it means an immense amount. Uh, the ramifications are almost endless. And the book uh, goes into uh, this aspect of things. So the moral of this Swati Song introduction uh, is that Monica's book, from its details to its major themes, which are, as I say, identity, culture, race, is an exemplary testimony, very patient and very inventive, to self-awareness. It, it passes that test very easily and awareness of the other, which it analyzes in the course of its poems to a T. It's um, exemplary of the nearly intelligible, nearly unintelligible, nearly unspeakable entanglements and intricacies of uh, the question, where are you from? Uh, which is, of course, to say that the, uh, it's, a, it's a very patient, close analysis of the language we put those things in. Monica Yoon. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that perceptive and wonderful and charming introduction, and I will be thinking about uh, the words athwart and tautonym um, for a very long time and hoping that other people learn to apply them to, uh, to me and to my work. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, you all, for coming out. Um, tonight to hear some, um, some weird poems. And um, I'm gonna start with a long, weird poem, which is the first poem in the book. And for some reason, you know, my poems, as Stephen mentions, um, 
have endnotes. Um, I had hoped that the endnotes would be helpful. I'm not sure they actually are, but I enjoyed writing them. Um, this one actually does require endnotes because it involves two figures. Um, and the two figures, one may be somewhat familiar to some of you. Uh, this is Pasiphae, uh, the um, wife of King uh, Minos of Crete in Greek mythology. And so the story goes that the gods sent a white bull uh, from the sea, and the King Minos was supposed to sacrifice the bull um, to the gods, and instead he kept the bull for his own herds. And so in punishment, the gods caused his wife Pasiphae to fall in love with the bull. So she gets the inventor Daedalus, uh, who is then working for them, uh, to make her a wooden cow. And she crouches inside the cow, is impregnated by the bull and gives birth to the Minotaur, who is later killed by the Athenian hero Theseus in the labyrinth. Um, and, you know, something interesting about Pasiphae, um, and, you know, I'm going to be reading a couple poems, at least, about Greek mythology, um, is that the Greeks would have understood Pasiphae as coming from Colchis, uh, as coming from Asia Minor. Um, as and she was one of a family of um, basically witches, enchantresses. Uh, Circe is of this family. Medea is of this family. Phaedra is um, of this family. A lot of the femme fatale of Greek mythology were associated with the East, with Asia, with what is taboo, with what is magical, with what is decadent, uh, with what is sexual, um, and. Um, Asia is, in fact, a Greek word. Uh, it refers to that area over there, the area of the rising sun, uh, where we have colonies. Um, and so these questions of nationalism and race would have come into the Greek reading of this myth. Um, and so, you know, our contemporary kind of whitewashed understanding of Greek mythology is not accurate is not accurate. Uh, the second figure um, is uh, a figure from Korean history, Sado, who is an 18th century Korean prince. He's the crown prince, the heir to the throne. Uh, he gets married and he, um, to a woman known as Lady Hyegyong, and he has a son who's known as the grand heir. And then he seems to go homicidally insane. So he rapes and kills dozens of courtiers um, and because he is the crown prince, there's not a lot that anyone can do about this situation. His person is considered sacrosanct. And even the king, his father, is in a quandary. Because if he executes Sado, then the entire line of succession will be tainted. Uh, there will be no heir. Uh, the same will happen if he exiles Sado as a criminal. So what the king does is, um, on a hot July day in Seoul, um, he asks for Sado to appear before him and to apologize for his crimes. And then the king asks for a rice chest to be brought. And a rice chest is just what it sounds like. It's box. It's about four foot by four foot by three foot. Um, it holds rice. Um, and the king asks Sado to get into the rice chest. And uh, grass is heaped on top of the rice chest. Uh, it's bound with rope. And about eight days later, Sado dies. Study of two figures, Pasiphae Sado. One figure is female, the other is male. Both are contained. One figure is mythical, the other historical. They occupy different millennia, different continents, but both figures are considered Asian, one from Colchis, one from Korea. To mention the Asianness of the figures creates a racial marker in the poem. This means that the poem can no longer pass as a white poem that different people can be expected to read the poem, that they can be expected to read the poem in different ways. To mention the Asianness of the figures is also to mention, by implication, the Asianness of the poet. Revealing a racial marker in a poem is like revealing a gun in a story or like revealing a nipple in a dance. After such a revelation, the poem is about race, the story is about the gun, the dance is about the body of the dancer, it is no longer considered a dance at all and is subject to regulation. Topics that have this gravitational quality of aboutness are known as hot button topics, such as race, violence, or sex. Hot button is a marketing term popularized by Walter Kitchell III in a September 1978 issue of Fortune magazine. 
The term suggests laboratory animals and refers to consumer desires that need to be slaked. The term hot button implies not only the slaking of such desires, but also a shock or punishment for having acted on those desires, a deterrent to further actions pursuing such desires, and by extension, a deterrent to desire itself. Violence and sex are examples of desires and can be slaked, punished, and deterred. Race is not usually considered an example of desire. Both the female and the male figures are able to articulate their desires with an unusual degree of candor and specificity. Both are responsible for many sexual deaths. The male figure says, when anger grips me, I cannot contain myself. Only after I kill something, a person, perhaps an animal, even a chicken, can I calm down. I'm sad that your majesty does not love me and terrified when you criticize me. All this turns to anger. Your majesty here refers to the king, his father. The female figure is never directly quoted, but Pseudo Apollodorus writes that she casts a spell upon the king, her husband, so that when he has sex with another woman, he ejaculates wild creatures into the woman's vagina, thereby killing her. Although the punishment is enacted on the body of the woman, this punishment is meant to deter the king from slaking his desires. Both figures are figures of excessive desire requiring containment. Both containers are wooden. Both containers are camouflaged with a soft yielding substance, one with grass, one with fur. Both containers are, an ingenious, are ingenious solutions to seemingly intractable problems. One problem is political, one problem is sexual. They are both the same problem. They have the same solution. The male figure waits in the container for death to come. He waits for eight days. His son will live. This ensures the succession, the frictionless transfer of power. The female figure waits in the container for the generation of a life. We do not know how long she waits. Her son will die after waiting in his own wooden container. This ensures the succession, the frictionless transfer of power. There are many artistic representations of both containers. The male figure's container is blockish, unadorned, a household object of standard size and quotidian function. Tourists climb into it and pose for photos, post them online. The cramped position of their bodies generates a combination of horror and glee. This in turn creates discomfort, the recognition that horror and glee should not be combined, that such a combination is taboo. The female figure's container is customized, lushly contoured. Its contours are excessively articulated to the same degree that her desire is excessively articulated. Artists depict the container in cutaway view, revealing the female figure within awaiting the wild creature. The abject position of the female figure on all fours, pressing her genitalia back against the hollow cow's genitalia, generates a combination of lust and revenge. This, in turn, creates discomfort, the recognition that lust and revenge should not be combined, that wild creatures and female figures should not be combined, that these combinations are taboo. The tourist can climb into the rice chest. The tourist can pose for a photo in the rice chest. Then the tourist can climb out of the rice chest and walk away. The artist can look into the hollow cow. The artist can render the contours of the hollow cow, the contours of the female figure. Then the artist can walk away. Both containers allow the tourist and artist to touch the hot button, the taboo, the desire, and the discomfort remain contained. Both containers allow the tourist and the artist to walk away. The male and female figures remain contained. Neither container, the rice chest, the hollow cow, appears to have any necessary connection to race. To mention race, where it is not necessary to mention race, is taboo. I've not mentioned the race of the tourist or the artist. The tourist and the artist are allowed to pass for white. The tourist and the artist are not contained. I've already mentioned the race of the poet, but to the extent that the poet is not contained, the poet is allowed to pass for white. I've already mentioned the race of the male and female figures. The male and female figures are contained. The rice chest and the hollow cow are containers. The rice chest and the hollow cow are not the only containers in this poem. Colchis and Korea are containers in this poem. Asianness is a container in this poem. 
Race is a container in this poem. Each of these containers contains desire and its satisfaction. Each of these containers contains discomfort and deterrence. Each of these containers contains a hot button, a taboo. The tourist and the artist can enter each of these containers. The tourist and the artist can touch the hot button and walk away. Each of these containers separates the slaking of desire from the punishment of desire. Each of the containers is an ingenious solution to a seemingly intractable problem. They're the same problem. They have the same solution. Each of these containers ensures the frictionless transfer of power. Each of these containers holds a male or female figure. The name of the male figure can be translated as think of me in sadness. The name of the female figure can be translated as I shine for all of you. OK, um, so um, another Greek mythology poem, this one shorter, um, much shorter. Um, and this is um, a figure out of Phrygia, um, King Midas, uh, about whom there are a couple of myths circulating. Um, and um, you know, to the Greeks, uh, King Midas was king of Phrygia um, and was also the um, legendarily the son of Kybele, uh, who was an Asian goddess who was thought in some ways to be threatening or you know making incursions upon the Greek pantheon. Um, and so a lot of people have taken the, um, the sort of hubristic myths of King Midas in which he is punished for his pride as a statement of the, you know, of the superiority of the Greek religion uh, over these other religions. Um, but you know, as you'll probably remember, there's a story of King Midas and the Golden Touch uh, in which uh, King Midas does a favor for the god Dionysus. And in return, he's granted whatever he wishes. And King Midas, in his foolishness and his hubris and his pride, uh, asks for everything that he touches to, turn to, uh, to be turned to gold with predictably awful results. Um, and when the story comes to America, um, in Nathaniel Hawthorne's version, um, Hawthorne adds a daughter to the story, a child. Um, and he names the child Marigold, who weirdly is now apparently a character in Fortnite. Um, but uh, so um, this is my version of the little story of, uh, of Midas and Marigold. A study of two figures, Midas, Marigold. Everything he touches turns yellow. We are meant to understand this as a form of death. Death is a wish to improve one's surroundings which is to say to be dissatisfied with one's surroundings is a form of death. To be dissatisfied with one's child, to wish to improve one's child is to wish its death, her death. The dead child is unchanging, therefore beautiful, which is why we say that death is the father of beauty. He created her, then he created her again. His tears gild his gaze, they harden as they hit the ground. They are a tribute scattered at her perfected feet. Unlike other forms of grief, they are durable, portable. A currency, they can be exchanged for other beautiful or useful things. His weighty head lifts a sunflower at mid-morning. The air glitters with particulate light. He takes a deep breath in, aspiration. A nebula of gold stars swarms into his open mouth. Gold spangles the moving darknesses of his blood, his lungs. Even the rivers in this country pave their streets with gold. Um, so I thought I'd read um, uh, from the Magpie poems, and let me just see how we are doing for time. I think I have time to do this. Um, so I'm kind of fascinated with magpies, and I went on an, a deep dive about magpies. Magpies have always been interesting to me because in most Asian, uh, East Asian cultures, the magpie is considered a symbol of good luck, um, a friend to lovers. It is, as Stephen mentioned, a traditional symbol of Korea. And in particular, it's kind of the symbol of Korea. Um, you know, there's this famous series of paintings, the magpie and the tiger, in which the tiger is the corrupt nobility and the magpie is the clever proletariat and the you know and the magpie is always winning the battles against the tiger um, 
But in um, most European traditions, the magpie is considered to be bad luck, um, sometimes even a harbinger of death or the devil, and is also considered to be like a thief, right? A hoarder obsessed with bling, with shiny objects, which turns out to have no scientific basis, but um, is just kind of this fable that, um, that Europeans have kept repeating. Um, and in America, uh, the, their um, magpies uh, pick ticks and other insects off the backs of cattle, and a rumor was started the magpies were actually drinking the blood of the cattle, thereby killing them. And so in Western states, um, a bounty was placed upon magpies, a nickel for every dead bird or egg, which nearly uh, drove the American magpie into extinction. So here's um, a couple poems about magpies. Parable of the Magpie in the Trap. A certain magpie was caught in a wire mesh trap, and the trap was small, and the magpie could not fly, neither could it stretch out its black wings. And the trap held no food, nor did it hold water, and the magpie was hungry and thirsty in the shadowless sun. And then the hunter came, and the magpie said, Hunter, you should release me from this trap, for I am no food for you, and my meat is stringy and foul in the mouth. But the hunter put food and water for the magpie in the trap, and then the hunter went away. And then the cold rains came, and the wind, and the magpie huddled in the trap, and the magpie could not dry its feathers, nor was there any dry place for the magpie to rest its feet. And the hunter returned, and the magpie said, Hunter, you should release me from this trap, for you cannot sell my feathers, for my black feathers are not beautiful, and neither are they proof against the wind and rain. But the hunter placed a stick in the trap as a perch for the magpie and placed a roof on the trap to shelter the magpie. And then the hunter went away. And the trap was on the ground, and the coming night was near, and the predators began to wake in the shadow of the woods, and therefore the magpie was afraid. And the hunter returned, and the magpie said, Hunter, you should release me from this trap, for I am no threat to you, nor do I prey upon your beasts, nor do I feed upon your gardens or your crops. But the hunter placed a larger trap around the smaller trap and turned to go away. And the magpie cried, Hunter, you must release me from this trap, for no animal preys on me, so therefore I am not bait for any quarry you might wish to trap and kill. Now the hunter spoke and said, Magpie, others will not come for you to eat you. Others will come for you to attack you and to drive you from their lands. For no, no, magpie, that you are not bait because you are wanted but you are bait because you are hated. And it is because you are hated that therefore you are valuable to me. And the magpie cried and said, Hunter, what quarry is it that you take such pains to trap and kill? And the hunter said, magpies. And then the hunter went away. Um, and let me read this one. Parable of the magpie in the mirror, uh, for the mirror test. A certain scientist had a cage and took a magpie and put the magpie in the cage, and the scientist watched the magpie in the cage. And after a time, the scientist said, it is said that the magpie is the wisest of all birds. I will set a test for the magpie, and if the magpie pass the test, therefore will I know it is my equal. The scientist took a tall mirror, therefore, and placed the mirror in the cage, and the scientist watched the magpie in the cage. The magpie in the cage looked at the magpie in the mirror. The magpie in the mirror looked at the magpie in the cage. And the scientist watched and wondered and said, how will I know whether the magpie in the cage sees that the magpie in the mirror is its own true self rather than another identical magpie? For I cannot read the black lacquered eyes of the magpie, neither can I parse the jagged scribble of its voice. Therefore, will I mark the magpie and observe. If the magpie see the mark in the mirror, and if it remove the mark on its body, therefore shall I know the magpie knows its own true self, even as I know myself. And the scientist took, therefore, the magpie, and placed a yellow sticker on the magpie's black neck, and placed a yellow sticker so the magpie could not see it, except that the magpie see the yellow sticker on the magpie in the mirror and the scientists watched the magpie in the cage. And the magpie in the cage looked at the magpie in the mirror, and the magpie in the cage reached up with its black claw and tore off the yellow sticker and crushed it in its claw and let the sticker fall to the soiled newspaper at the bottom of the cage. 
And now the magpie spoke and said, scientist, I submitted when you placed me in this cage. And then I said, this scientist, therefore, will know me as an equal. And scientists, I submitted when you placed a mirror in my cage. And then I said, this scientist, therefore, will know me as an equal. But now, scientist, you have marked me with a yellow sticker. And to this marking, I do not submit. But because I do not submit, you know, therefore, that I know myself. And you know me, therefore, to be your equal. So now, scientist, you must release me from this cage. And the scientist said, not unkindly, for the scientist did not mean to be unkind. Not so, magpie, for you have known yourself in the mirror, and you have seen yourself marked with the yellow sticker, and you have torn the yellow sticker from your neck, and therefore you have passed the test by which I know you as an equal. But because you are an equal, you must be marked with a yellow sticker in order to leave this cage. Um, I think I have time for one, do I? Yeah, I'll make time for one less magpie poem, and then, so two more poems. Pa Parable of the Magpie in the West. And the magpies flew west and came to a land where there were many flocks and herds that were ill-tended and diseased. And the magpies said to each other, indeed, this is the place we have been seeking, and here we will make our home. For here there is food for us, consuming the vermin that so torment these animals, and open raw wounds in their tormented flesh. And this will be our work and the service that we offer to the Westerners, and therefore they will welcome us and reward us richly. And the magpies tended to the herds, and therefore the magpies found their work and raised their children, and other magpies came to join them. And the Westerners watched the magpies, and at first the Westerners were glad in their coming for the care that the magpies gave to those among them so long uncared for. And therefore the magpies walked proudly among them, and the magpies had neat black coats and neat white shirts, and the magpies nodded their neat black heads and called to each other with loud voices. And then some Westerners hated the magpies and said to the others, see how the dark hands and dark mouths of the magpies are ever wet with the blood of their work and their food. Surely, therefore, these magpies are unclean in their ways, and therefore we should not suffer them among us. And then a sickness came upon the land, and many died among the Westerners and also among the magpies. And those who were sick were cared for by the magpies. And still some Westerners hated the magpies and said to the others, surely this sickness came to our lands with the coming of the magpies. And surely, therefore, the magpies have brought this sickness to our lands through the uncleanness of their food and the uncleanness of their ways. And then some Westerners hunted the magpies. And some of the magpies cried out and said, why do you hunt us? Are we not those who care for you even in this sickness? But other magpies answered them and said, but has it not always been so? You who have chosen to care for those who are not your own. OK, one last poem. Um, it's a long one, though. <clears throat> and it's, uh, we're back to Prince Sado. So I don't have to explain him again. Detail of the rice chest. In the 2015 Korean film, The Throne, the rice chest sits in the center of the vast symmetrical courtyard of Changgyunggung Palace. The film is called The Throne in English. In Korean, it is called Sado. A Korean speaking audience would be presumed to know in advance who Prince Sado was. An English speaking audience is presumed not to have this knowledge. Although this is a historical film for a Korean-speaking audience, the well-known story functions as mythology at the level of symbol. For an English-speaking audience, the unknown story functions as narrative at the level of plot. There is an I in this poem. I know who Prince Sado is. I can read the Hangul word Sado, but I do not speak Korean. I am a member of the English-speaking audience. I know about Prince Sado from the memoirs of Lady Hyegyung, 1805, but I know about the memoirs of Lady Hyegyung from Margaret Drabble's The Red Queen, 2004. Margaret Drabble's The Red Queen is about Lady Hyegyung, but Lady Hyegyung was never a queen, nor is she associated with the color red. The name is misleading. The name of the film The Throne is also misleading. The film does not focus on the throne, it focuses on the rice chest. Like a magnifying glass, the stone courtyard focuses the gaze on the rice chest. The gaze increases in intensity and heat. 
July temperatures in Seoul average 84 degrees Fahrenheit with average humidity of 78%. I have been to Seoul in July. I have one hanbok on a summer day, but only once. I have never seen a rice chest. The rice chest is a functional object and stands in contrast to the highly decorative architecture of the palace courtyard. Its plainness renders it inscrutable, impenetrable. Because of its oversized lid, the rice chest appears top-heavy, charged with kinetic potential. On its four small feet, it seems to be crouching on its haunches to be hunkering down. Hunker down is a Scottish term that refers to squatting on the balls of one's feet, low to the ground, but in readiness. I have hunkered down, but only once. Midway through the film, the rice chest is bound with thick rope, with a knotted webbing of four or five thicknesses of coarse fibrous rope. The quantity of rope exceeds the function of the rope to such an extent that the rope binding seems decorative, symbolic. I have been bound with rope, but only once. There's something almost comic about such an excess of rope to bind a single imprisoned and dying man, the way there is something almost comic about a circle of guns pointed at a single unarmed man. I say almost comic rather than actually comic because although these images provoke the same pent up laughter as a same pent up tension as suppressed laughter, I do not know who would find either of those images funny. After it is bound, the lid of the rice chest is heaped with grass. <clears throat> For a Korean-speaking audience, the grass-covered rice chest would resemble a traditional grassy burial mound, would evoke ancestral tombs, or even the prehistoric dolmens, which feature massive rocks perched on four small feet. I have seen the grassy burial mounds of my ancestors, but only once. For me, the rope-clad, grass-covered rice chest resembles a barbarian idol. According to the online uh, etymology dictionary, the word barbarian comes originally from the Greek and carries a derogatory connotation, those who speak a language different from one's own. When I say barbarian, it means I find the rice chest foreign, inscrutable, although it is Korean. Koreans speak a language different from my own. In the film, the walls of the rice chest are made of thick planks with chinks between them that admit slim shafts of light, drips of water. But the walls of Korean rice chests are made of solid panels of wood. Planks with chinks between them would admit pests, especially insects, into a rice chest. Such a rice chest design would not be functional. Partway through the film, we see a multi-legged insect enter the rice chest through a chink between the boards. The single insect is followed by a horde of identical multi-legged insects wriggling through the chinks in the walls. We understand the insects to be a hallucination of the dying Prince Sado. Their function is symbolic, the danger of allowing chinks in the walls. In the film, Through the Chinks in the Walls, Prince Sato is able to see and to speak to his dog and to his 10-year-old son, the grand heir. But in fact, these incidents never took place. They are not hallucinations, but fabrications of the filmmakers. Just as the multi-legged insects, the chinks in the walls of the rice chest are fabrications of the filmmakers. <coughs> The chinks allow the gaze to penetrate what would otherwise be impenetrable, to penetrate the inscrutable barbaric figure of the rice chest to reach the human inside. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is familiar to both Korean and English-speaking audiences, Tom Snout, a rude mechanical, plays the part of a wall that features a crannied hole or chink. The joke is that a human being portrays an inhuman object, since only an inhuman object would feature such a chink. I do not know who would find this joke funny. When asked to show me thy chink, Tom Snout holds up two fingers. I have seen boys hold up two fingers. Calling me a chink, they would put their two fingers at the corners of their eyes, stretching their eyes into narrow slits through which it must have been difficult to see. They found this joke funny. I've seen men hold up two fingers. They would use their tongues to penetrate the chink between their fingers, rendering the gesture obscene. The tongue thrust between the fingers reads as sexual, whereas an outthrust tongue without the fingers would be merely rude. Neither gesture is intended to be funny. Both the boys and the men would use their two fingers to symbolize my body, a body that without a chink might seem impenetrable. The primary meaning of the English word chink is a split or crack, a narrow fissure or valley. 
Chink also has a racially derogatory meaning, referring to a Chinese person or, by extension, to any East Asian person, since an English-speaking person using a racially derogatory term would not be expected to differentiate among East Asian people. I have asked boys to differentiate among East Asian people. Upon being called a chink, I would say, you're so stupid, I'm not a chink, I'm a gook. The Korean American comedian <laughs> Margaret Cho later used a similar statement as a punchline to a joke. I find this joke funny, and some members of a Korean speaking audience would find this joke funny. The term gook was used by English speaking soldiers to refer to Korean people during the Korean War. It was later used by English speaking soldiers to refer to Vietnamese people during the Vietnam War since English speaking soldiers do not differentiate among East Asian people. The term guk may derive from the Korean word for American, miguk. Hearing Korean people say this word, English speaking soldiers thought the Korean people were calling themselves guks, miguk, and followed suit. The word miguk in Korean literally means beautiful country. Miguk is a transliteration of the Chinese characters meguo, which also mean beautiful country. I know how to pronounce miguk, but not meguo. There are several accounts of why meguo seem, came to mean American. Some claim it's a simple phonetic approximation. Others claim that meguo was selected out of several possible phonetic approximations by 19th century American missionaries. I do not know which account is true. All commentators seem to agree that neither Korean people nor Chinese people literally believe that America is a beautiful country. But both Korean people and Chinese people must call America beautiful in order to speak its name. Neither Korean people nor Chinese people refer to themselves as gooks or chinks. Neither Korean people nor Chinese people refer to themselves as Korean or Chinese. Korea is an English word which seems to derive from a mispronunciation of the name of the Goryeo dynasty by Silk Road traders and was first recorded by Marco Polo. China is an English word which seems to derive from a mispronunciation of the name of the Qin dynasty by Silk Road traders and was first recorded by Marco Polo. I have said Marco Polo's name many times in a game that requires you to say his name many times. I do not know the origin of the game. Because of the R's and L's, Marco Polo would be a difficult name for Korean speakers to say, but I am not a Korean speaker. I've called myself a gook many times. I've called myself a chink only once, when a white high school friend used the term in conversation, then stopped, realizing her gaffe. Don't worry, I said. I know what you mean. X is such an FOB. What's an FOB, she asked. Fresh off the boat, I said. I may be a chink, but at least I'm not an FOB. We laughed together to relieve the tension, although I do not think either of us found my joke funny. I used the term FOB to show that I considered X to be foreign, a barbarian. I called myself a chink to make myself seem more American. Fresh off the boat was my white husband's favorite television show during the time we were married. When we watched it, I hoped that laughing at the pushy Chinese immigrant mother on the show would lessen his dislike of my pushy Korean immigrant mother. I hoped that allowing my white husband to treat my parents as endearingly foreign, fresh off the boat, like the endearingly foreign TV family of fresh off the boat, would make myself seem more American. None of the actors in Fresh Off the Boat are fresh off the boat. Nearly all of them were born in America. By pretending to be foreign, they make English-speaking audiences feel more American. My parents are not fresh off the boat. They have been in America for more than 50 years. They speak both Korean and English. A television is a box that allows us to put people inside it. The television is sometimes called an idiot box from the Greek for private person from idios, meaning one's own, but those inside the box have no privacy. We put the inscrutable into a box so they may be scrutinized. I made X inscrutable. I put X into the box. I made my parents inscrutable. I put my parents into the box. I decorated the box so it seemed foreign, barbaric. I made the box inscrutable so it seemed like a distant ancestor. I buried it so it seemed like a grave. I made a chink in the box that the gaze could penetrate. I stayed outside the box. I treated what was inside the box as a joke. I was the English-speaking audience. I watched Fresh Off the Boat on the Idiot Box. 
I watch the throne on the idiot box. In the throne, a parent puts his son in the rice chest. After the son's death, the rice chest is forced open. After the son's death, his mouth is forced open. Three spoonfuls of rice are forced into his mouth, rice that might have kept him from starving to death in the rice chest. After the son's death, a name is forced into his mouth. The name is Sado, a name which has meaning for Korean-speaking audiences. I have said Sado's name many times. The son never called himself Sado. There was never a chink in the rice chest. No one could see into the rice chest. There is a you in this poem. You are a member of the English-speaking audience. I let you see into the box, into what is private, into what is foreign, into what is inscrutable, into what has been buried. I am the chink in the box. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, very, very much. Um, we, don't, we don't usually do Q&A uh, here, but we're uh, open to uh, new approaches. And um, I have a question or two that I'm, I might ask Monica, uh, and maybe a couple of you might have questions that you might ask her. So let's let this thing fray out a little bit here at the, at the end and uh, see, see what happens. Um, it's, these are, uh, for me, very complicated poems. Uh, and so I kept returning to uh, language. Obviously, Monica is very interested in languages and in, in language on the one hand. Uh, and on the other hand, she's, she's very interested in racial identity or in ethnic identity and, and race. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering uh, what to think along these lines. And I'm, I'm trying to, I keep trying to, because I'm lazy, uh, I think about, about allegorizing some, some of your work. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering what thoughts you might have along these lines. I mean, I could, I, interpreting the magpie, for example, seems to me an interesting project. Towards the end of your last poem there, you, you do kind of tend toward an allegory. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in, um, I guess, in the degree to which you expect your audience, your readers, to come to their own conclusions uh, about, about some of the issues that you raise. And there are a number of issues that you raise, but you, you often just let the issues lie there, which I, myself, like. Uh, but I'm wondering what thoughts you might have along those lines, whether you were ever interested in the notion of allegorizing more than, than you have. Uh, so any, anything that you might tell me that would help me to get a hold better of the poems, which I don't necessarily need, but I'm interested in what you might say to that. Do you have a response? Absolutely. Uh, um, you have a mic, too. Uh, yeah. You have, oh, you have everything. I'm, I see. That's what I was putting <laughs> You can come and sit next to me. I won't bite. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, the, mag the magpie poems that I read, I titled as parables because I very much do intend them to be allegories. Um, because after I was writing these relatively inconclusive poems for a while, I was thinking, you know, I just want to be didactic for a while. I want to tell people what to think. Yeah, okay. And parable is a form that allows you to do that, to say, OK. Um, but I think it's right to think about um, you know, symbol and allegory in a more open-ended way. Um, and one of the things I do um, is I try not to know where the poem is going when I start. I mean, that first poem I read was literally like, okay, I think that these two, po these two figures have something in common. Uh, what do they have in common? Okay, um, they're both contained. Oh, yeah, they're both Asian. And so let's, let's start from there and let's just start building on that. And mm -hmm. um, 
I'm using kind of a stiff form of language there. Um, you know, a very like a language that's reminiscent of law, which I used to practice. Um, and I think of it like you build a stair step uh, out of this rigid language and you don't know where the, you know, and then you build another stair step and you don't know where the staircase will go, but you just keep building and eventually the whole thing just doubles back on itself and it makes an interesting shape. And so that's kind of what I do. Yeah, okay, no, that, that's, uh, that's very, very helpful to me. Um, and I think reinforces uh, what the way I thought you got about the process in mm -hmm. the poem. Um, let me let me ask you a um, the other question uh, <laughs> that I that I be, uh, began my in little introduction with. Do you, what do you think about the relationship between your work and prose and poetry? Do you think about the prose poem at all? Is this um, a handy notion here or not? Some of your uh, pieces do look like poems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lots of white space, yeah. Uh, lots of places for notes mm -hmm. and for the reader's thoughts and so on. Um, but many of them don't. And so I'm just wondering what thoughts you might have about prose and poetry and their relationship in regard especially to your own work. Yes, um, I mean, I think there is one long <coughs> essay in the poem, in the book, which is, I think it's something like 39 pages long, which is a lyric essay. I mean, it does have page breaks, this is feeding back kind of a lot. Yeah. Um, but um, it does have page breaks, um, but um, it's meant to be prose blocks. Right. Um, a lot of the other poems are in these kind of sentence strophes uh, that are not lineated in the strict sense of lineation. Um, but I was thinking about them um, more like... Um, uh, more like the tone itself was creating a... Um, was creating a sort of form. I was thinking of them in a relationship between syntax and, fo uh, and tone, uh -huh. uh, rather than line. And I was just kind of trying to use that as a formal device in right. the poems. I mean, right. usually I teach my students that you know there are two systems of organization at work in a lineated poem. There's lineation and syntax, and the relationship between lineation and syntax and that counterplay is what makes the lineated poem. When you subtract lineation from that, what do you have? You have syntax, but then you can add yeah, a sort of right. rhetorical spin onto the syntax right. to make it you know right. to up the interest. Right. Did you did you go from writing in lines mm -hmm. to writing in this looser syntactical form? Oh yeah, I think You for started my, as a... Yeah, I think my first two books right. were as, in extremely short <clears throat> lines right. and I think I was known as kind of a minimalist yes. at that point. And at some point you start to think, well, you know, line breaks, uh, a very short line poem is like a helicopter parent. It's kind of like, all right, look there, now look there, now look there, now look there. You know, I mean, you're just over the reader's shoulders just, you know, directing their attention at every moment. and. I wanted to give, particularly in these um, poems that were dealing with race, I wanted to give the reader play to bring their own, yeah. bring themselves into it a little bit more, to let things spin out um, without being as, you know, intrusive yeah. uh, into the poem. Yeah, okay, that's, yeah, that's very interesting and helpful to me. Um, do, we, do we have some questions from the audience? I see that we do. And we also have some... Uh, some ushers who will bring microphones to you. And I think one is doing so right now, though it's hard for me to see. Um, hi, I, so I'm wondering in the process of creating these poems, I mean, as you mentioned, you take these ideas and you decide, you know, let's draw the connections between them. At what point does the voice come in, um, you know, choosing, you know, the Per, the parable voice, this very argumentative voice is that baked into the creation or something that's placed upon those ideas afterwards? Yes. Um, I think that the poems come across as a consequence of tone. Like, until I have the tone, I can't write the poem. And if I don't have the tone right, then I just toss the draft. So, you know, I think I was trying to write a Prince Sato poem for years. I mean, ever since I read, you know, ever since I learned the story, I was trying to figure out how to write about it. But... I did not want to do what I thought a lot of people 
did, which was to further exploit and an exoticize an already exploited and exoticized uh, historical figure. Like I didn't want to put the camera into the rice chest and you know and witness his suffering. You know that was sort of the opposite of what I wanted to do. So I was like, okay, well, how can I stay outside the rice chest and talk about this? this containment, this, um, this imprisonment as a thing. And I thought, well, maybe I can do that using the sort of analytical tools that I learned as a lawyer, right? Or at least that tone and see what happens if I try that. But that was probably like attempt 11 or something at, at writing this poem, so. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> I shouldn't point. Uh, hi, Monica. That was wonderful. It was was really thrilling. Um, you know, I felt both kind of umbuzzy and tense as you were reading. So that was that was that was, that was something I like. Um, and I thought that Stephen's question about allegory um, and led you know things off wonderfully. And the way and I was really intrigued the way that you immediately took that into the question of um, the proverbial, uh, the parable, and and the language, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I found myself um, hearing these two different modes, one of which was the proverbial, the, the parable, which, um, you know, which I mean, allegory added another dimension to it. And then I, and, and it, it was interesting to hear you talk about a tone and about diffidence in, in relation to the proverbial. Um, but the other mode that I heard, which was in the first Sado poem mostly, was Something about, which is, enough, so my question is about how these um, dictions <clears throat> uh, uh, relate to questions of lyric diction, yeah. which is a kind of presumption that we would all have in our ear or minds. And so what I was hearing in the, in the first Sato poem was a degree of abstraction. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you about <clears throat> abstraction, not in terms of concepts, but in terms of language. And we might, you know, ordinarily think of um, that as our language becomes more abstract, it becomes less poetic, right? That, that you're moving away from either the sensuality of poetic language or from you know, the affectivity of it, the sentimentality of it. Mm -hmm. um, but there's another way of thinking about abstraction, which is that it's an intrinsic property of, of language in the sense that when you think about <clears throat> language as a medium in relation to visual media, language is much more abstract, mm -hmm. right? It has virtually nothing to do with its reference, right? And so you could say that, uh, that as you move towards abstraction, you are moving towards the, the very core of poetic language. So I wanted to ask you about your thoughts about abstraction um, and poetics. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, I have only a very, you know, an experiential view of poetics, but, you know, I always think of the lyric as connected to the question of personal voice. Um, and in that sense, these poems are kind of anti-lyric. I don't associate either of the tones that I take on uh, in the parable poems or in the, you know, in the study of two figures poems as being as really sharing any properties with my voice. The parable poems, I was you know, trying to mimic the syntactical structure of the King James Version of the Bible. Um, and, the, um, and, the, um, and in the Sado poems, I was using uh, tone as a constraint. Um, and, and I was trying to mimic the sort of declarative rhetoric of statements like beauty is truth, truth beauty. I mean, of course it's not, but uh, what happens when you use that kind of propositional declarative uh, and use that as sort of a building block to something? What does it become? It's not exactly lyric. Um, and a lot of the things I say are just plain wrong, you know, like, you know, uh, death is a wish to improve one's surroundings. No, it's not. You know, it's, um, you know, obviously that's wrong, but, you know, you just say it in a, you know, in a determined way and it creates its own rigidity that you can build upon. So, um, so I think that, you know, abs I mean, I do, um, you know, uh, Abstract is a um, abstract is a word that I could understand in a lot of ways. Um, I was thinking of it more just in terms of the concrete, in terms of the material. Like here is the, this slab-like language that I'm going to play with for a while. It, it also occurred to me as related to virtuosity. Mm -hmm. There was a kind of virtuosity there in the Sado poems, and as you spun things out into these gossip and abstractions. Yeah, it was fun kind of building these structures and seeing how high they could get with no apparent, you know, 
arc to support them. Just you know, they're just supporting themselves on the um, on this accumulation of rhetoric, uh, and they start to kind of resonate in that, and eventually tear themselves apart. That, that's fascinating. You know, the 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 poetic that you that you're kind of sketching here is, uh, I mean, one might say it's almost perverse. Uh, oh, it's totally perverse. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, to uh, to to think that you know that death is the father of beauty or whatever, uh, and to to say that this is the, the, to say that this is of course flat wrong, mm -hmm. uh, is is a very interesting statement about your work and and uh, about what how one is to to read it. Uh, it's a, an entirely different way for me of looking at poems. So it's something I felt mm -hmm. uh, throughout your that that poem. Uh, that's why I, you know, said what little bit I said uh, yeah. about your offerings there. So I'm, I'm fascinated at your at the concept. I, is there a uh, an origin for this concept apart from you? I mean, is there? I understand you're you're not speaking as a theoretician tonight, mm -hmm. but is there anybody that you've read that kind of gave you a way into this approach? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I. Um there are a certain number of contemporary poets who are writing in this kind of flat, effective way. Uh, you could think of Lely Long Soldier's poem 38 uh, mm -hmm. as being a model. Mm -hmm. um, yay! Uh, uh, Bono Koppel's The Vertical Interrogation of Strangers. Um, yeah, I see some fans. Uh, even Claudia Rankin's Citizen, um, you know, in the way that the um, the agency is completely taken out and you're left with this second person you, which becomes this blank in the poem in mm -hmm. the shape of a black woman that, uh, that you know, readers who are habituated to or dishabituated mm -hmm. from that racialized space are invited to step into, right? Um, so. Yeah, okay, okay. yeah. I uh, just want to start off by saying that I'm a big fan of your work. Um, we actually just read Blue Acre in this poetry group that I run. And uh, I have not yet read From From, but I think I find a lot of similarities in terms of the formal constraints that we've been talking about, um, but also the just general tone of a sort of analytic precision that you said that you picked up from law. And my question is sort of about to put it broadly, what is the relationship between poetry and power? Especially thinking about the way that you use law in Black Acre and the way that you use mythology here and from from, it becomes quite clear that they're both sort of structures through which power accrues itself through narrative. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder as a poet, how you sort of think about that relationship between poetry and power, especially coming from a legal background. Yes. Um, I mean, for me, the question of power, uh, the only way in which I understand power is mediated through language, because that's my background. Um, I don't have an understanding of power, like, you know, out there. Uh, but, you know, when I was thinking about power as a lawyer, I was thinking about law as a form of power language that, um, that there is differential access to. And whether or not one can speak that language fluently uh, determines one's access to certain kinds of power. And law, of course, is, you know, is backed by uh, the, threat of vi uh, the threat of state sanctioned violence. Um, but, you know, you can have, you know, both. Um, you know, I, I say I have worked in two systems of analogical reasoning. Uh, one is poetry. One is uh, the common law. Uh, where, you know, where precedent is nothing but you know, analogy. Um, be, um, but it's backed by uh, real world power. So, um, and the sort of assertions that I'm talking about. I mean, I was a campaign finance lawyer before I started teaching poetry. And you know, Citizens United, you can think of as three metaphors, you know, money is speech, corporations are people, and uh, and elections are marketplaces. And you can say that all of those are wrong, but it doesn't matter. They've been, you know, they've been declared, and, and that declaration has the force of law. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, that's... So, so I'm interested in maybe in creating these relatively brittle rhetorical constructions in which they're somewhat right, but there's also a lot of wrong in there. Um, I'm hoping to create some, I don't know, degree of resistance or, you know, mm -hmm. one talks a lot about double consciousness, of course, but, you know, there's some, some way in which those, the truth and falsity is occurring simultaneously um, that mm -hmm. I was interested in. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you for coming and reading your poetry. I really, I'd gotten the book before and I enjoyed reading it. Um, although I'm not the most intuitive poetry reader, <laughs> um, I wish I were. Um, I, there was a couple things I wanted to ask. One is I'm I kind of I'm interested in the way you describe things, and it almost sounds like you're describing um, somebody who's like a visual artist, like a painter or a sculptor, in the way that you're you know talking about it. And I'm wondering if you're influenced by that at all. You know, if you use that when you're thinking about how to construct things, do you an- analogize to those mediums? And then something else, which I kind of, the question I have, which is kind of inchoate, but uh, it's, you know, I read some of the other poems and there's a lot about these containers, containment, you know, containment certainly in terms of, you know, identity. But then it struck me also, like, do you ever deal with those who are not contained? Because that's like such a, you know, you, if you're contained, you know, you're, you're, you're boxed in by your own identity, but then you have people who are so not contained. And do you deal with that at all? Um, you know, when you, and what, what that sort of means in our society to have people that are yeah. completely not being contained. And that seems to be a, a big problem, not just that some are put in the containers, but that some lack all containment. Mm-hmm. I mean, to be contained in some way is to be marked. Uh, to be marked is to be contained. And, you know, some people have the privilege uh, and agency of remaining relatively unmarked uh, in dominant spaces. Um, and, yeah, it is something that I think about a lot um, and often in quite a visual, uh, in quite a literal way and often with respect to the visual arts. Uh, one of the things I do on the side is uh, I'm a member of a curatorial collective called the Racial Imaginary Institute. And um, we had done this show that was based on um, Sarah Ahmed's uh, The Phenomenology of Whiteness, which was, you know, very much about, like, the, you know, whiteness as habituation within certain spaces, the way in which one's body behaves, um, and what it means to step into and out of such spaces in which certain bodies will be more or less visible, more or less uh, habituated. Um, and, And I have, but, you know, I have always thought of Poetry as a very physical activity for me, you know, um, and very analogous to working with a physical medium. You know, uh, language is fun because it's a it's a medium that has historical properties as well as you know sonic and semantic properties. And uh, um, and yeah, so and it's it's also quite portable. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Monica. That was really loud. I don't like this. Um, I'm one of Monica's students, sorry. Um, So in, so not to be reductionist, but in this you kind of have like a post-structuralist bent most definitely because you're kind of like giving material to these like boxes of air that surround the racialized subject. Um, I'm really struck, I've always been really struck by the way in which the, the labyrinth is brought down to the space of the wooden box and speaking within that poem. Um, and the labyrinth, in, in some readings, a minotaur is placed there as like a guardian of some, some treasure at the center, and others, the, it's, the labyrinth is so intricate in order to, to, to trap, uh, trap it. Um, and within the, especially like the poems of the magpie, there's ideas of these, of these um, double binds placed by this sort of uh, oppressor figure um, within the space. The, and so like, a, a labyrinth is ultimately a space that you enter in order to reach exactly where you started, in a sense. Um, in the same way, this kind of placing of these boxes of, of like pointing to it and saying, this is a box that I'm contained within. These are the boxes that exist around me. These are the boxes that exist around those that I feel I share like a common subjectivity with. Like, Ultimately, like you're performing it to like people who still engage in the hegemony. What do you ultimately see as like the mission of like stepping into that maze, knowing mm-hmm. you may very well come out the other side exactly where you started? 
Yeah, it's interesting. I haven't actually written a labyrinth poem, and I, you know, the last thing I need is more encouragement to write Greek mythology poems, but, you know, thank you. Uh, now I feel like maybe I have to write one, because, you know, um, your question made me think very much about the way in which the a labyrinth becomes a metaphor for this kind of language that we've been talking about, and whether or not the labyrinth is legible, uh, whether you're able to negotiate, uh, you know, the... Um, the labyrinth is the question of whether you survive or not. And the Minotaur, who is understood as this half-human, half-Asian, um, you know, uh, creature within the labyrinth who's, you know, killed by that sort of, you know, exemplar of Athenian-ness, Theseus, right, um, is this monster who was unable to, na you know, to speak the you know, to, to make the maze legible that is legible to others. Others are able to read the labyrinth and he is not. Uh, and this is what leads to his undoing. We, I have, I have said that we, I said originally we were gonna have a couple of questions and I got involved. <laughs> and, uh, so, and so I forgot that uh, Monica has got to catch a plane tonight. Uh -huh. And I've, I have already gone longer than I thought we would go. And I apologize uh, for that. On the other hand, I'm glad that you've got a chance to, to say uh, what you've said so well. And I thank you very much for, uh, for coming this evening. I, uh, Monica teaches at Irvine, but uh, she lives mostly on the East Coast. And so we're very lucky to, to have her uh, out here for this. And I'm certainly glad that she came. I, I thank you very much. And thank you guys very much for coming tonight and being so participatory. Uh, and come back. Our, our next reading is about a month away. Boris Draliuk uh, uh, will be reading. He's uh, um, a great translator from the Russian and from the Slavic languages as well as an excellent poet, especially about things uh, Los Angeles. So uh, put your name on the list, come back, and uh, I hope I haven't made you late. No. no. Okay. <laughs>